Okay. So uh, here, uh, thank you for having us. We are, uh, I am very happy to be uh, uh, in the conference. Uh, the discussions have been uh, super insightful. Um, so this is joint work uh, with Santiago Perez, who is here, uh, and uh, he will be answering questions uh, in the chat. Um, so the motivation uh, of this paper uh, comes uh, from the idea that uh, you know, a main promise of civil service reform is that by uh, doing the civil the, the reform, you can attract and retain more qualified employees, which then would translate into better uh, bureaucratic performance. Now, while reforms have been shown to improve bureaucratic performance in some uh, particular uh, settings, generally, uh, in general, it appears to be no silver bullet. So in an assessment of 439 reforms, funded by the World Bank, only 41% were rated uh, as successful. Moreover, uh, you know, besides uh, uh, this wide uh, variety of, of outcomes uh, of these reforms, there is very little evidence on whether reforms actually improve personnel outcomes, uh, including in those reforms that have been shown to be successful to improve uh, bureaucratic performance. We believe that opening the black box of the bureaucracy by looking at personal records can shed light on the mechanism that uh, is underlying these varying degrees uh, of success. So that's the direction that we take in this paper. Uh, so in the paper, we will ask the question, how did the 1883 Pendleton Act impact the functioning of uh, US custom houses? Now, the Pendleton Act uh, uh, is important to know that this is a very uh, landmark legislation in the US. Uh, it was the first attempt to implement a merit system uh, in, in the US federal government. And it was super influential for the subsequent reforms that happened at the state and uh, local level. Now, we will be zooming in in the functioning of US custom houses. Uh, at that time, uh, U.S. custom houses were performing a, a key state uh, function, which was to collect revenue. Uh, and in particular, they were collecting 50% of all the revenue uh, of the federal government uh, at that time. Now, what the Act did exactly was to introduce mandatory uh, exams for a selection of some federal employees. Uh, now, the reform itself was quite broad, so it was not restricted to custom houses. Uh, in a companion paper, we look at the bureaucracy more generally uh, in the US. Here, we'll be focusing uh, on custom houses. Uh, and the idea is that custom houses offer us a unique opportunity because there was a natural experiment in the way that they implemented uh, the reform. So basically, custom houses with more than 50 workers by 1883, uh, were mandated to hire for some of the positions using exams. Custom houses with up to 49 workers, there was no change whatsoever. So what we'll do is to compare, is to implement a difference and difference strategy where we compare these reformed custom houses with the unreformed un 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 custom houses before and after uh, uh, the reform took place. To do that, uh, we will collect uh, new, so we went to archives and basically we collected, uh, uh, we did a digitalize new personnel data uh, of all the custom houses uh, and we link this data with uh, population census. We also uh, collected receipts and expenses of those custom houses to try to understand a uh, consequence for performance of these. Um, now, what we find, so basically we find that improvements so of the, the reform led to improvement in personnel outcomes. So it reduced turnover, particularly in protected positions. It also improved uh, professional backgrounds of these employees. However, we find no evidence of improvements in cost effectiveness uh, as measured by revenue collected uh, uh, per uh, dollar spent uh, in the collection process. Um, and we argue that a key mechanism underlying you know, the lack of improvement, despite the improvement in personal outcomes, is the interplay between the merit and the non-merit hires within those uh, reformed custom houses. So we show that there is a reallocation of hiring towards exempted position, which will uh, generate a, a change in the structure, in the personal structure within these organizations. 
and we show that there is no change at the top of the hierarchy as well. Uh, and we, we try to investigate whether this uh, also plays a role in, in the lack of improvement uh, uh, in cost effectiveness. So that's basically uh, the paper. So let me tell a little bit uh, why, uh, how exactly this relates to the literature. Uh, so we relate to literature uh, of civil service reforms uh, in two ways. So first, there is a, a past work who had, uh, that had studied how civil service reform affect policy outcomes in, uh, in bureaucratic performance. Uh, so, for example, the work of George Lee and Ariana looking at civil service reforms at uh, U.S. states and U.S. cities, um, and the work of Guo looking at uh, British colonies. What we add to this body of work is to look at, uh, investigate bureaucratic performance, but also uh, look at uh, uh, personal outcomes throughout the layers of the bureaucracy. So by doing so, we think we can shed light a bit on the mechanisms that are uh, explaining a little bit why there is varying degrees of success of those reforms. Second, we relate to a literature of the political economy of this reform. So there is a body of work that is uh, uh, studying which elements are relevant for the passage of these reforms. Uh, uh, and basically what we are highlighting here is that one, one of these elements is that you could stagger, for example, the reform and you, you do step by step. First, you will protect a subset of the employees and then you grow, up, grow in, in how comprehensive is the reform. Despite that this could in increase the chance of passing this reform, uh, basically it comes, what we show is that it comes at a, a cost of reducing effectiveness, which can kill the, uh, the long run attempt of doing a more comprehensive reform. On the personnel economics of the state, uh, this literature has shown that you can improve, uh, you know, this, uh, by changing the selection method, you perhaps can improve the characteristics of the selected employees. We are complementing this by showing that it can change personal structure uh, by changing the selection method. And finally, dependent on act is important legislation. We're the first to provide a quantitative assessment uh, of the consequences. So the, a, a, a little bit about the background uh, here. So what is uh, uh, custom houses look like before the reform? So basically they were performing uh, a key function, which is to collect uh, uh, revenues. Uh, and the, comp the process was basically a, a process of trying to identify the good and categorize and make sure they are complying with the tariff structure at the time. It was a, a, a complex process prone to errors and corruption, but more importantly, I think there was a general perception that uh, uh, basically the lack of a merit system was underlying uh, uh, the uh, huge cost of collecting revenue in those custom houses. So reforms uh, would that reformers would attribute the uh, basically lack of merit system to a very high cost. So here we have a, a few. And in the paper, we have a few quotes of the uh, underlying uh, argument of the time, saying that the cost of collection of, of, on our total importations was more than three times uh, in France, more than four times in Germany, and a five, five times as in Great Britain. So it was a general perception that the US did a very poor job in collecting revenue in those custom houses. And why is that? So the, the, basically the argument would come uh, out of something that would involve overstaffing, corruption, and carelessness, uh, carelessness that would happen in those uh, custom houses. So here again, another example, examples of ignorance, incompetence, carelessness, and fraud on the parts of the various employees. So basically there was a, a general perception that these custom houses were not very well functioning, and they would attribute uh, to the lack of the merit system. Now, this is uh, just a picture of what, uh, you know, a Newbury port custom house where they would say that the uncle son spent $228 to collect $5. So not a very uh, effective organization to, to achieve the, the objective of the And so what did the reform did exactly? So the, the custom house with more than 50 employees uh, by 1883 uh, were added to this classified service. So this implies that uh, at the time, 11, uh, uh, 11 custom house were added and is uh, basically our treated uh, uh, units here, the reformed uh, custom. 
custom house. And this is out of 130 custom houses. So what these reformed custom houses look like? So basically they, they were required to hire for mid-tier positions using exams. Uh, this implied uh, no tenure granted for, for those positions, uh, but it was quite comprehensive in, in the sense of the, protected, the number of protected positions were uh, uh, reaching 75% at the time of the passage of the, the reform. And 10 years after the reform, 60% of the stock of employees were under uh, this system. So it was quite binding. Now, there were some exempted positions. Uh, so within reformed custom houses, employees making less than 900, they, they could continue to be hired as usual. And leadership positions also uh, with their uh, personal assistants could also uh, continue to be hired outside of the system. Um, now, the conventional wisdom is that the the reform was super effective. So this comes from reports uh, at that time, as well as modern scholars arguing uh, exactly the same point. Um, this uh, uh, basically just to have a sense of where these custom houses are uh, in the US territory, they are quite uh, spread out. The orange are reflecting basically the reformed uh, uh, custom houses. Um, the data, so we, we are using two pieces of data here. So the first comes from the official register of the United States. So basically these are documents that allow us to track all the universe of federal government employees uh, on a biennial basis. So every two years we can look at the name, the position uh, and the units in which uh, the workers uh, uh, are employed in the US government. Uh, we digitalize these records for 20 years. Uh, this allows us to see what happens uh, 10 years before the reform and 10 years after the reform. And so we have uh, 50,000 employees here, uh, uh, combinate pairs uh, of uh, custom houses uh, uh, employees. And we link these records. So basically this only give us, uh, this data uh, only give us a rough measure of like the, the network, but doesn't allow us to understand measures of quality of these employees besides just their wage uh, at the time uh, employed, right? So we link these records to the population census uh, just to recover measures of quality and previous occupations of, of these workers. And we use state-of-the-art uh, uh, linking algorithm that basically my co-author had done methodological and applied contributions to that. So basically we implement uh, uh, this method using name and place of birth. Uh, and we documented there is no correlation between the reform and the likelihood of matching. So that's useful for uh, making the argument that any attrition cannot explain uh, uh, our uh, results. So that's what the, uh, the documents look like that we transform into. Now, uh, the second data set, so with that, we can kind of recover the structure of the uh, custom houses and the personnel records, but we don't know the performance. So we match with the second data set, which allow us to, to measure expenses and receipts uh, of each custom house. So again, this was uh, uh, a document that we had to uh, digitalize uh, uh, in, in order to uh, analyze the data. So we have access to total expense as well as more disaggregated uh, expense in the revenues. Uh, we also uh, allow to, to get the tariff collection, but also find and more granular information about the revenue. And we digitalize that for the same time period. That's an example of what the, the, the data looks like. Um, okay, so then that's a, our uh, empirical strategy. Uh, we are doing just a classical difference and difference. So we have custom house fixed effect and time fixed effect. Uh, and uh, the classified uh, is what we are calling these reformed custom houses, are the custom houses that by 1883 had more than 50 employees. And we keep this category fixed throughout. So it's, uh, it's basically it's whoever was treated at the time in which the reform uh, was implemented. And we are interested in the differential effects so of the beta is capturing the differential uh, increase in the, uh, in, in, in the outcome that happens in those custom houses after the reform was implemented. We cluster standard errors at the custom house level. Often we are running regressions at the personnel at the individual level. Uh, 
And we impose a sample restriction that custom houses with more than 10 employees uh, will be basically uh, our control here, right? So basically we are restricting the sample to more than 10 employees. Basically this is, was based on um, parallel trends and we are still figuring out what is you know, a more systematic way to choose this uh, sample restriction method. Uh, validation, we do a bunch of exercises. Perhaps the, the main, the most relevant is the parallel trends of, on outcomes pre-reform. Uh, and uh, there is parallel trends. We also uh, present evidence of no manipulation at the 50 employees threshold. And since we only have 11 custom houses that were treated, basically we do some corrections for a small sample, uh, conducting randomized inference and excluding uh, one custom house at a time. The results are all robust to, to these exercises. Um, okay, so the, the effect on personal outcomes, so what what uh, the argument uh, would go is that by uh, conducting the, the reform, you would lower, uh, you would reduce turnover, uh, and you would uh, increase the quality of personnel hired because you would be prioritizing skills over political connections. And this potentially could improve bureaucratic expertise. Uh, employees would stay longer in the job, and this potentially can be good for the performance. Uh, and so. The first uh, uh, element that we document is, is, is an effect on turnover. So what we see here in the y-axis uh, is uh, a measure of turnover. The blue, again, are the uh, untreated custom houses. The orange are treated custom houses uh, th that were reformed custom houses. Uh, and what we see, for example, in the first dot, what we are seeing is uh, a, a likelihood of, of a personnel that will no longer be in the reform uh, in, in that custom housing uh, in about 40 percent. So this means that 40 percent of the workers working in that custom housing in 1871, two years after that, 40 percent of these workers will be gone. Okay, so this uh, number is actually not that far from modern U.S. Uh, so if you look at the modern U.S., nowadays it's like 30 percent, uh, 29 percent, the equivalent number of employees, not in custom house, but in, in the bureaucracy in general uh, in the US. Now, what we see is that these uh, dots, they kind of follow uh, each other, the blue and the orange, up to 1883. So uh, when it starts 1883, what we see is that the blue is much more volatile. So basically they, they, they go up much more and it seems that the orange it stays quite uh, at, the, at the lower level relative to the blue. So what we argue here is that the merit system is shielding uh, the bureaucrats from being replaced here. And in particular, we see these effects happening uh, when there is a party transition. So in 85 and 89, there is a change in the political party. And so that's exactly when the merit system is uh, working the most. So this, uh, this story basically is, docu is uh, this table is basically documenting what I just said. So basically, there is an overall decrease in 12 percentage points in the turnover uh, of employees. And this turnover is particularly uh, lower when uh, there is a, a parity change. That's what column three is showing, right? So there is interaction with, with parity change. The second column uh, is basically showing that uh, the, the, the change in turnover is happening uh, in particular for those mid-tier positions. So in particular in positions in which the merit system apply, uh, it's not so relevant for the positions in which uh, within those custom houses that were not protected uh, by the merit system. Now, the second question uh, is whether it improves the quality of employees. So for that, we link with personal, uh, the personal records to earlier population census to recover their previous occupation, literacy, and other uh, uh, characteristics of these employees. Uh, and so we investigate their professional background in adulthood prior to joining the bureaucracy. And so we try to understand whether they are more likely to have a professional occupation, such as being a lawyer, a teacher, or an accountant before uh, uh, joining the bureaucracy, whether they have any occupation, they report any occupation, or just uh, they are not, doing, uh, uh, not reported uh, as employed. Or uh, whether there is uh, changing in literacy as well. 
So here, what we are documenting is the effect on, uh, on reporting a professional occupation. So what we see is that overall in the stock of employees, there is no effect on the stock of employees. But particularly for new hires, what we see is that the increase uh, in the number, in the share of, of new hires that are uh, in professional occupations. And this, again, is happening precisely in those occupations that were protected, were uh, mandated to participate in the exam. That's what the column four is showing. Uh, so in general, uh, uh, this uh, uh, effect on professional, uh, on increases the chance of having a professional occupation. We also see that there is a, a, a you know, side effect of that, is that there is a reduction on uh, reporting no occupation uh, whatsoever. So you're improving on that margin. There is no effect on uh, illiterate, on profession of women, and on white. So no uh, representation doesn't seem uh, to, to be changing uh, here. Uh, the effects on, on cost effectiveness. So then the next step is, well, if it improves personnel outcomes, what happens exactly with the performance in those units? So we look, we think that there could be two channels, two set of uh, outcomes here. So on the expense side, uh, sure, the, the Congress was basically limiting a little bit the total expense that this custom house would have, but there could be, uh, you know, less patronage could decrease the incentives to employ people, which could lower the personnel expense, and perhaps they would uh, use uh, expenditures uh, within the custom house in, in, in another way. Uh, a second channel is through revenue, so tariff structure in the business cycle is pretty much uh, not under the control of the custom house, yet uh, one could imagine that uh, less politicization could lower corruption, which could increase enforcement, and more skill and, and a longer horizon, uh, employees staying for a longer uh, term, could also improve in terms of errors and compliance with this complex procedure of you know, assigning goods to the tariff structure. That's basically what we see in terms of expenses. Uh, so uh, there is basically no change in, in the expenses uh, uh, as a result of the custom house. So the blue, again, is reporting the unclassified and the orange, uh, uh, the classified. And we see what we would expect is that there would be an increase, uh, a relative increase that would kick in in, in the reform custom house. And we don't see uh, they are basically uh, exactly the same, uh, the same trends here. Likewise, expense, the revenues, uh, receipts, uh, uh, we also don't see much uh, going on. So they continue to be parallel before uh, and after uh, the reform. And of course, if there is no change in receipts and expense, the revenue per dollar uh, uh, collected, per, per dollar spent, is also uh, doesn't change. So, so the, this is basically the corresponding table. Uh, and what we can say so is that the effect size in all those margins are, are pretty small. Uh, the standard errors are large because here, uh, you know, we, the sample is not uh, huge. But yet, we can rule out the increase on revenue per dollar that is larger than 13.5%. Uh, uh, so what, why exactly is this happening? So we documented there is an improvement in personnel. There is not much going on in terms of the cost effectiveness of the custom housing. Why is that? So why there is a, this lack of improvement in, in cost effectiveness? So we investigate whether there is changes, uh, you know, one potential explanation is that spillovers from the classified to the non-classified custom house. We show that there is no change, no de the heterogeneity with respect to the distance to a closest custom house. So it doesn't seem to be uh, this spillover explanation. Another potential explanation is that, well, you're bringing higher quality personnel, but at a cost of lower effort. So currently we are exploring whether uh, there is an effect on fines and fees, uh, which is basically a very small share of, uh, of revenues, but are a, a important dimensions because they are kept in the custom house instead of being sent back to the federal government. And so perhaps that's where the margin of uh, effort would would be most relevant, and so we are exploring this. Now, what we have uh, so far uh, as an as explanation for what's going on is the interplay between the merit and the non-merit hires within classified uh, customers. Um, and so let me talk about that. So uh, 
we what we document is that so again this is uh, what uh, the orange is representing the reform custom house what we see is that there is an increase right after the reform increasing the share of employees below the salary cutoff and this is uh, uh, happening uh, exactly so the below the, sh the uh, salary cutoff is exactly those employees that were not mandated to participate in an exam so in general we see that there is an effect uh, uh, in, in all those so column one and two is representing an effect on, on overall all the employees that are exempted from this exam but there are two cut two uh, two motive two reasons of being exempted so basically leadership positions and below the salary cutoff. So most of the movements are coming at the bottom of the distribution. So they are distorting a lot the number of people that are in the very bottom of the distribution. Uh, and this can be detrimental for performance. So first, because if you pay a lower wage, it's likely that you will recruit a worse personnel. And in fact, uh, you know, personnel that makes less than 900, they are less likely to, to have professional uh, uh, occupations. Second, because this actual, uh, uh, re, uh, by distorting the share of personnel and having a budget that is somewhat fixed, that implies that basically you are reducing the number of the relevant employees in the relevant occupations. So basically, this implies a reduction in the number of employees uh, that are uh, fundamental for the operation of this custom house, such as clerk, inspectors, examiners, and etc. So these two elements makes uh, uh, the distortion to be quite disruptive for the working of the custom house. Second, uh, at the top. So at the top, what we documented, there is no change whatsoever uh, in, in, the, in this, those same margins. So there is no effect on the turnover of collectors. There is, the reform doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't improve the professional background of collectors, and in part because they, co they continue to be political appointees. Now, this can be uh, uh, problematic because they first they can facilitate the distortion at the bottom of, of the organization. Second, because they, them themselves can be a relevant uh, element, a relevant piece for the working of the custom house since they are the top manager uh, of this custom house. So what we do next is to try to understand how relevant is uh, this lack of, of changes at the leadership. So the collectors matter. So collectors were nominated by the president and confirmed by Congress. Uh, and so what we do is to get a, a, the proceedings of the US Senate list all nominations and the reasons for the nom nomination. So death, removal, uh, re reassignments, uh, and resignation, and end of term. So here I'm giving an example of Jefferson, uh, who was nominated for a custom house, and he's succeeding Peter who is deceased. So that basically means that Peter died in office. So we identified 42 deaths of collectors while in office. So this, we are trying to go in a direction closer to John Zanoken, who looks at 57 deaths of country leaders. And uh, the idea is that we use uh, John Zanoken non paramedic test of whether our leaders matter in order to understand two things. So first, how relevant is uh, you know this bureaucrat for the operation of, of the custom house so whether they matter for receipts and, and fines and, and second whether they facilitate the personal changes that we are observing do they matter for a turnover and professional background so that's this is a result that they're still uh, work in progress and uh, uh, and that's basically where we are going next uh, just to conclude, so uh, meritocratic uh, uh, civil service remain a elusive goal for uh, many developing countries. Uh, the US, I think it, it presents a, a historical experience that offers opportunity to understand how you know, a country uh, succeed in, to transition to a professional bureaucracy. And what we do is to look at the first attempt uh, of implementing a merit system. With, uh, which came with all you know, the problems of the first attempt. Uh, and so we uh, documented there is an improvement in personnel outcomes, but limited effect on cost effectiveness. And we argue that the likely mechanism is an idea of pits, middle, broken tails, where uh, you know, it, it highlights the importance of understanding this merit and no merit hires within uh, the organization. Uh, and also, 
kind of suggests that this piecemeal approach uh, to reforms may not pay out because the failure of an early parsimonious reform may kill the support, the political support for a more comprehensive subsequent reform that, that is coming. That is all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I think uh, you are five minutes. Uh, uh, you know, we are five minutes early, so we we'll have fifteen minutes uh, discussions. So any anyone want to jump in first? Okay, so maybe I will start. So um, I have two clarifying questions. Did you have any kind of uh, any archival sources? On, uh, let, on on audit report, you know, like uh, something that you know tell tell us how um, you know those in the treatment and control group were operating, and you know, so that you can use it to support uh, some of the evidence that you provide, even if it's qualitative. Because I mean, sometimes those proxy for human capital are not very insightful, you know, like year of education, for instance, you know, knowing what we know about how people were functioning is something that might be interesting. The second point is about, um, um, you know, externalities, you know, I mean, for instance, not between treatment and control group, but within organization, for instance. You know, it could be that uh, one of the channels through which uh, you have effectiveness is highly educated people. Um, they share their knowledge, their experience with others. So the whole group improve as a result, you know. So it might be some kind of human capital channel that could be interesting. I don't know whether it's something you can get to. Yes. Uh... So on the first, I think the audit report, your idea would be uh, in terms of corruption or uh, just documenting how effective they were. Uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes yeah. institutional audit report uh, talk about dysfunctions and effectiveness, mm -hmm. and corruption. You know, it gives you it gives first hand knowledge about how those organizations were operating. Especially yeah. sometimes it gives names of individuals or sections that were the most effective. So it just say, it might be a very interesting source of information that you might use. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we have, uh, Santi, maybe this uh, connects that. So we have a, a list of collectors, which were kind of the head of uh, the custom houses that were somewhat honored, so they participated on this list, oh. that they, they would basically be honored, uh, and, and that's, that kind of gets to how functioning were, uh, but it, it's getting a little bit on how good that particular collector was, not necessarily the whole uh, organization of the Custom House. Uh, audits, uh, I don't think we have, uh, at least not in a more systematic basis so far, um, but yeah. So we cannot hear you, Santi. Oh, oh. on mute. Santiago, on mute. Yeah. Oh, no, still not. No. Mm. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Hi, Diana. So, very nice paper. Hi. So a couple of questions and a, and a comment. So mm -hmm. in terms of questions, we're still wondering about the mechanism, if it is selection or something else. Mm -hmm. And um, so I don't know if you have data about what type of people used to apply before the reform or after the reform, you can take a look. Or if you had the same set of people um, uh, before and after the reform and uh, they perform differently, then maybe that also says something about the selection channel. Secondly, uh, this, um, can you say something about the social norm? So here, like it's an interesting reform because, because at the lower levels you have meritocratic appointments and the higher level you have patronage. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, yes, so in terms of political economy, that's a strange, um, that's an interesting case. Uh, but 
can you find within uh, your sample, which is massive, um, cases where you have greater or lesser alignment uh, between the collectors and the bottom, and you can exploit that, that type of heterogeneity? And lastly, the comment, uh, which is similar to, to related to the second comment, and also to your last point about the piecemeal approach to reform, is uh, like a previous work, uh, especially Merrily, Grindle, and others have also shown that uh, mm -hmm. Usually the first attempt at uh, ending patronage uh, jobs for the boys uh, are usually um, not aimed at completely eradicating patronage, but at protecting pockets of patronage. Um, and penitential lectern is also one of those maybe where you have pockets where um, uh, patronage is protected for the, for the collectors, uh, but removed at the bottom. And maybe you can say something in your paper about that. Yes, uh, so let me try to, to answer those. Uh, on the pockets of collectors, so your concern is whether uh, this creates some endogeneity. So you're trying to, to, the ones that you will reform are the ones that you're trying to protect. And so uh, that's kind of what where you're heading, or you are just saying uh, the process of the reform. Uh, so, to, like, help me understand where, you, like, where you are going exactly with the pockets uh, of uh, of you know of non-functioning uh, organization. Oh, now we cannot hear. <laughs> uh, so, I was trying to more understand the mechanism so through which this. Uh, your results to better understand the mechanisms of your, your, your findings. Yeah. Um, so I think it, it could be that there are some pockets uh, of collectors that uh, are of, sorry, pockets of bureaucrats that are super dysfunctional. Uh, we can say a little bit, so one effort that we're doing is trying to connect uh, the surnames and the place of birth of uh, these individuals with uh, politicians at the time. And so we're trying to see whether there is some variation in terms of bureaucrats who are politically uh, connected, uh, and perhaps we can identify something along the lines that uh, is, there is greater political alignment, in, in particular in those custom house, and if there is something uh, uh, more uh, uh, there uh, uh, to see some heterogeneity with respect to, to the, you know, the greater alignment that can generate more patronage and therefore uh, the reform could be particularly effective uh, there. Um, I think, and uh, did I answer all the questions? Was there the, the first, I guess, I'm missing, right? So the first was on the reform. Um, can you remind me the, the first or, or did I answer all the questions? Yeah, good. Okay. Can I go so, next? Sorry, can I say something? Sorry, no, no. Yeah, yeah Santi, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. So, so going back to Leonard's point, so, so one of the things that we quote in the paper is that there, are this, there, there were these uh, investigating commissions appointed by, by Congress uh, with sort of the goal of, of trying to understand uh, how, how these custom houses were working and what were the issues and uh, you know, related to patronage. And we, we cite a lot of examples in the paper about like the type of specific practices that, that these people were getting wrong. So for instance, one example was, uh, you know, that the people that were supposed to wait staff, uh, you know, they were just relying completely on, on what the merchant would say. The merchant would say, you know, this weights 10 pounds and these people would take this at face value and that how, how this could lead to kind of, uh, you know, underpayment of, of, of tariff duties. We yes, have, I get Yeah. Go ahead, I think, Lo. I think Christina, Christina reads her yeah. hand. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, this is super exciting. Uh, very interesting talk. Thanks for that. So my question relates to whether um, we think that these 10 years are enough in the post period, whether they are enough to, to capture the full effect of the policy. So here is what I'm thinking, um, especially on the East Coast where most of your treated observations seem to be, 
um, they are relatively close to each other, these, um, these, uh, these custom houses, right? And so I can imagine a scenario in which really what's happening is that it's really the same set of people that are working um, in these custom houses. But what's happening is the smarter ones or the ones that could study for the exam quicker are being hired for these medium level positions. And their friends that were the less quick to learn the exam material and like, couldn't pass the exam, they are just being hired for the lower level positions. And you do show that, um, that the hiring for the lower level positions without the exam does increase in these treated, um, the treated custom houses. So I wonder, given your amazing data and the amazing data collection you did, I understand you can follow the same people over time. So I wonder if you could tell us a little more about whether it is indeed the case that it's the same people being, the, the same set of people basically being hired in to different positions. And maybe in particular also in the East Coast, maybe it's not exactly at the same custom house, but maybe it's next door, like Portland versus uh, Boston, for example. Um, and, and related to this, the, the reason I started out asking the question by saying long-term versus short-term effects is because maybe if you go a little further in, in time, then you basically, these people are retiring or are too old and there's a new set of people coming in that are already aware of, um, of the exam requirement and in general, like that there you get a better selection. I know from my own work how hard it is and painful it is to collect all these archival materials. So I realized that that might be a real constraint, but I think that, um, you know, the, the question is still um, relevant, I think. Yeah. So uh, two things, I think, I think it's a good idea to kind of track the specific employees, whether they are going to a different custom house and try, and we can certainly try to do that. What we did so far was to speak about in general, whether there is a larger effect if you are around these reformed custom houses. Right. So if there is a labor market uh, effect from reforming one custom house, maybe there could be some spillovers that are different if you are very close, if you are another un uh, unreformed custom house, who is, which is very close to a reformed custom house. So we don't find heterogeneity with respect to this element. But we could certainly try to, to get a more granular and try to see, uh, you know, is the, there is some individuals that are going to a different custom house. Um, and in terms of the time dimension, that's what we had collected so far. So basically 10 years. Uh, and as you said, so basically it, it grows, uh, the, the complexity of the process grows uh, with the how close, how far we go, because basically it gets larger and larger. So the federal government uh, in, in the span of uh, 80 years, so it grows from 5,000 5, bureaucrats to 100,000 bureaucrats. So every two years that passes, they, this, this data set, this you know, set of documents gets larger and larger to do. But basically, yes, we can, uh, that's a possibility to expand uh, the, the size. Great. Is there any other question? Any other question? Any other question? So maybe uh, you know maybe you can take one minute to wrap up and to. Uh, yep. Yeah. So I don't know if Santi is also you want to say something about this question particularly. No. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, sorry. Maybe yeah. about the about the issue of the data. So so one one challenge that we have is that by eighteen ninety four they they included a, a, a bigger set of custom houses under the classified system. So that they have a cutoff of 20. And then two years immediately after that, they, they further reduce the cutoff to five. So which means that essentially by 1896, we no longer have a control group. So it's really hard to, uh, to study these things. Uh, so, so basically we kind of, our experiment pretty much goes only up to 1895. 
yeah, we could still capture a little, like, you know, because these reforms take time to, so even if you reform, you... I see, yeah, yeah. You could, could still yeah. say something, but like, uh, if you, uh, you yeah. would have this issue. Uh, and also, like, I'm checking the chat, so Adnan, I think he, you pointed, so your first question was about this, uh, no, is it really screening that you are getting uh, or uh, is really the pool of bureaucrats who are applying to, to those jobs? So we, uh, so far we cannot really separate these two. We had, uh, at some point we saw some documentation that was leading towards like saying who were the applicants uh, of, of jobs positions, but that's not something we have in a quite systematic way. So we cannot really tease apart, you know, is this screening or actually the pool of, of people who, who is changing. We do have a different paper in which we are trying to understand something about uh, um, basically representation in the bureaucracy, whether representation is changing, uh, which is also, uh, you know, confounding these both effects, which is uh, whether people are applying that is different or the screening uh, methodology uh, is different. Uh, but it's a, it's a good point that we cannot actually separate this. So. All right. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank very you. Much.